Good evening, I'm John Carter and welcome to Poland Daily. The striking teachers and the government will resume negotiations over teachers' salaries on Thursday morning. However, it's hard to see any chance of a breakthrough given the vast differences between the two sides. While there seems to be no end in sight for the conflict, many are wondering whether high school exams are going to take place. One thing is for certain, if the Polish Teachers' Union don't find a compromise, the exams are unlikely to happen. More than 377,000 eighth grade primary school students across Poland took part in a foreign language exam today. Similarly to the junior high exams, everything went smoothly. Two exam cycles, the junior high and the eighth grade exams, generally proceeded without any major incidents in accordance to the procedures and the law. At the same time, teachers and other employees of Warsaw schools protested today in front of the Ministry of Education, unhappy with the the government's proposals. How is the strike as of today? 500 out of 540 schools which joined the strike today keep on protesting. Only 7% dropped out. Are you mad? Have you had enough? We've had enough. We've had enough. It is us, the teachers, who have to deal with serious moral dilemmas, but we've passed the point of no return, because if we back out now, it would be hurtful to everyone, students, parents and teachers alike. Today, the high school students haven't finished their program, so they couldn't be allowed to write the matura exams. Last week, Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki proposed a special debate about the state of Polish education, which would take place after Easter. The Polish president Andrzej Duda offered to host the debate at the Belvedere Palace. Tomorrow, the negotiations between the government and the teachers' unions are set to continue at the Social Dialogue Center. We, as the government side, have been invited by the Polish Teachers' Union and the Trade Unions Forum to come at 10 a.m. to the Dialogue Center. We will come with proposed solutions in a written form to reach a compromise. When it comes to teachers' councils, where the marks are to be evaluated and approved, in most schools they will be postponed until 24th or 25th of April. This, ladies and gentlemen, means that there is a still a real chance of reaching an understanding or to at least suspend the strike for the time being and then work out what to do next at the special debate. The fate of this year's matura exams is dependent on the outcome of tomorrow's talks. If the classification councils don't take place, the maturas, which are to commence on May 6th, could be threatened. Nonetheless, the Ministry of Education keeps stressing that they will take place on the planned dates. Five weeks before the European Parliament election, law and justice have turned the light on the campaign for the adoption of the euro. Apart from Germany and Holland, most countries within the eurozone have experienced economic stagnation at best. Jarosław Kaczynski, the leader of law and justice, challenged the leaders of the other parties to sign a declaration which would, effectively, only enable the adoption of the euro when the Polish economies match the Germans or the Dutch. This is not a political declaration. It involves both sides of the political divide. The main concern is the financial interests of the state and the well-being of Polish citizens. All the parties, obviously including ours, and I'll repeat that I have already signed this, made sure that Euro will not be introduced until Poland reaches similar developmental level to the countries on our western border. In this case, the reference is to Germany. The Polish lot is protected us from financial insecurity and ensures faster development. As you know, the Eurozone is today in economic stagnation and simultaneously the Polish Zloty is protecting our level of living. The Zloty, moreover, allows us to grow our economy by organic development as well as by implementing correct policy of the state. The president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, has announced that he will be making an appearance in Poland next month. The former Prime Minister of Poland said that he will have an interesting announcement to make when he visits Poland on May the 3rd. He added that May the 3rd is a good time to speak about the Constitution, Poland's place in Europe, the importance of freedom and free elections. 
Politicians from Civic Platform and the Modern Party say they are anxious to know what the former Prime Minister has to say. Piotr Appel from the Cookies 15 movement believes that nothing substantial will come from the statement apart from the escalation of political tensions. Law and justice politicians have no doubts that Donald Tusk is simply conducting polls concerning his popularity and assessing his chances of returning to domestic politics here in Poland. I will not speculate what the content of his speech will be. I think this is an attempt to build his domestic political position. However, I am not really interested in that. I think that we don't need old politicians. We need new energy, which can lead us to have real conversations about the problems of the citizens. Here we can see clearly that apart from this political and ideological layer, the main issue is between Schetina and Tusk regarding the leadership of Civic Platform. If they don't find a common conclusion, the entire Civic Coalition may fall apart. The parties that constitute it will go their separate ways, with the Civic Platform going back to the defense. This leaves the Law and Justice Party with a clear pathway to victory in the parliamentary elections. I believe this will be the outcome, and because of that, it does not really matter what Donald Tusk may may or may not say. This is not the first time that a former Prime Minister has tried to mark his presence in national politics. There was a similar case in December 2016, when part of the opposition occupied the plenary hall of the Parliament. Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki is visiting the United States. During his stay in Chicago and New York, the head of the Polish government will meet with investors and people within business circles. The Prime Minister will also give a lecture at New York University. The stay of Mateusz Morawiecki in both American cities is also associated with the promotion of a documentary about Poland entitled Poland, the Royal Tour. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to the city with the second largest population of Poles, the beautiful city of Chicago. I know many people here who constantly think about Poland. They think about how to invest in Poland, and this is the first reason why I am here. I will meet with potential investors who might create new jobs in Poland. I will meet with business owners who have expressed interest in developing their businesses in Poland. It is always a good thing to try to create jobs in Poland, particularly well-paid jobs. After those meetings, I will take part in the presentation of a movie, Poland, the Royal Tour, which I had the privilege to take part in. I have a similar program for my visit tomorrow in New York. In addition to those two major points of my US trip, I will take part in several meetings with Polish Americans and the patriotic celebration of laying of a wreath at the Tadeusz Kościuszko monument. In the evening, I will attend the presentation of the movie, Poland, the Royal Tour, which is promoting Poland to prospective visitors. It introduces Poland to all guests from abroad, depicts the richness of our culture, the beautiful countryside, the depth of our history, and how tasty our fantastic Polish food is. I hope that these two days with the movie presentation will help with the promotion of our country. On a cold November night in 2015, 25-year-old Eva Tillman left a party with her work colleague Adam. Nine months after the girl's body was found in the river Varta, Adam was charged with the murder. Today, a court in Poznan found Adam not guilty. He had no motive to kill Eva and no time to commit the crime. The prosecution has two weeks to appeal the verdict. <laughs> Tomasz Komenda spent 18 years behind bars until a court found him innocent of the rape. Now he is suing the state and demands compensation of 18 million Polish złoty. His lawyer, Zbigniew Czwiankalski, was a minister of justice during Tomasz Komenda's prison sentence. The highest compensation ever awarded by a Polish court was 3 million Polish złoty. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening at Poland Daily. I'm John Carter. Stay tuned after the break for Poland Daily weather. It's followed by the business. And stay tuned for the culture, history and the travel.
Good evening, I'm Paulina Oderstein and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's start with tonight. So as we can see, the temperatures will be rising up and it will be warmer than last night was. Five degrees will be seen in Rzeszów, Krakow, also in the north around Gdańsk. Uh, four degrees in Lublin, also around Katowice, Wrocław, Zielona Góra, Poznań. And coming more into the central parts of the country, also Koszalin and Szczecin will be seeing four degrees Celsius tonight. And now let's check tomorrow. So tomorrow looks like spring is back. Uh, 18, 18 degrees will be the maximum in Bydgoszcz, 17 degrees in Warsaw, also around Zielona Góra, Szczecin and Koszalin. The minimum temperature tomorrow will be 13 degrees around Rzeszów. Even though it will be quite sunny tomorrow, we are expecting some showers as well. And now let's see the forecast for the upcoming three days. So on Friday, nice and sunny, especially in the western parts of the country, up to 19 degrees in central Poland. On Saturday, up to 21 degrees, so nice and warm in the southwest part of the country, 17 will be the minimum. And on Sunday, a bit cooler, uh, 14 degrees will be the minimum in the northeast and the maximum will be 19 in the southwest. This is all for tonight. Thank you and see you soon. And our guest tonight is Bernard Otterstein, President of Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Poland. Sir, thank you for coming to the Poland Daily Business Edition. Thank you. Well, uh, actually, what is the relation between Poland and Canada right now in the economic uh, dimension? Well, in general, the relations between Canada and Poland are excellent in, in every way. Uh, and economically, it's, uh, there's no difference. It's really, really good. Uh, and, uh, Can we name the Canadian companies that are operating in Poland and bringing benefits and the Polish companies that are doing business in Canada? Well, certainly there are some big names. I mean, I'll, I'll mention a few. We have here Pratt & Whitney Canada, we have MB Aerospace, we have Bombardier, uh, big companies, McCain uh, and others uh, in, in, in the high-tech and IT and transportation sectors. Uh, as well as uh, food processing and other things. And then we have, on the, on the other hand, some Polish companies in mining and energy, such as KGHM uh, and Orlen Upstream, who are uh, acquiring assets in Canada and uh, expanding their, their resource base, which is an important thing uh, on, on the upstream side or on the, on the resource side for, for Polish companies that need to tie uh, or... or uh, get some of uh, the, the benefits of Canada's resource base. Right, uh, the Canada is a unique place in the world, huge natural resources, uh, exactly. friendly atmosphere and nice place. Uh, Poland as a part of the European Union has a very special relationship with Canada uh, and the, the, the law is the same from a Canadian point of view here as in Germany or in France. Is Poland for Canadian business a little bit more interesting than other countries? Well, Poland has something that other countries don't have in Europe right now, and that is a lot of talented young people, uh, an incredible uh, resource in that sense, uh, something that Poland is outstanding for at, th in, at this time in the world are its people and their abilities. And that's something that I think few other countries in Europe can offer to that extent right now. So Poland in, certainly has big advantages for Canadian and for a lot of other international companies because of the skills and the abilities and the motivation of its people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say in the international trade, the, the, the services and goods are, are the things that we measure to say what is the atmosphere, what is the level of relationships. Polish companies, what Polish companies can offer to the Canadian economy? I think that Polish companies can offer quite a lot, uh, especially since Canada and the European Union signed the Comprehensive Agreement on uh, 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 the Com Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement last year. It's in provisional force, but it allows Polish companies not only to export their products to Canada, which can be very attractive, those products, uh, because Canada doesn't have perhaps 
uh, all of the things that Poland has in terms of innovative new products uh, that small and medium-sized Polish companies are producing. Uh, on the other hand, Polish companies can also participate in procurement opportunities with Canadian government bodies, from the municipal to the provincial to the federal level. Uh, and they can, they can uh, participate on an equal footing with Canadian companies in many sectors. So that's, that's something very interesting. That's a service, perhaps, or, or a, a product offering, but, but public tenders are open for Polish and for all European companies in Canada. Do you know any examples of Polish companies taking active part in tenders in uh, Canada? Not recently, but uh, I do know some historical uh, cases of Polish companies building bridges, for example, in Canada. But I could imagine that Polish companies could really engage in a lot of uh, service So this famous Polish hydraulic uh, or Polish plumber can go from yeah. France to Canada. Yeah, he, he certainly can. But the, there, you know, there's an ocean in between. And so the distance is longer for, for smaller operators. It's more an opportunity for bigger companies, I think. Well, but having said that, I think there are also small the opportunities for, for exporters and other SMEs to, to, to take advantage of the CETA opportunity. Right. Well, we are very soon uh, there will be hot summer and vacations, at least in Poland and in Canada, by the way, at the same time. Um, is there growing touristic uh, movement between Poland and Canada, like Poles are going to, for vacation to Canada? Uh, that's uh, difficult to gauge right now. However, the interest in Canada has always been strong from the Polish side. As you probably know, we have about a million Polish Canadians. Right, so but that, this is like the, historical the, the, the historical the historical ties are strong, and a lot of Poles actually travel to Canada to visit their relatives, and I think that tourism from Poland to Canada is in many ways related to that. But I have heard of a lot of people actually going now just to see Canada's natural sights and, and wonders, which are really, really amazing. Or sail on the big lakes instead Abs of crowded absolutely. Missouri, you can take the yes, lakes in Canada. The beauty of the Canadian wilderness is that you can enjoy it by yourself or in a small group of people with nature, and, and that's something that's, that's perhaps unusual in Europe. But you have to take a gun to the forest. <laughs> I actually never have, but uh, it's easy to come into contact with wild animals such as bears, and you have to be careful. Yeah, because they may not understand your they jokes. They may not understand uh, Polish, for example, or, or <laughs> other <laughs> strange activities. Bernard Otterstein, uh, Polish uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Poland. Thank you very much, sir, for coming to our tiny show. And hopefully you will come next time to talk about more specific businesses that are d definitely developing between our countries. Yes, there's a lot to talk about. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you've seen uh, Poland Daily Business Edition. And join us next time. Good evening, I'm Paulina Adrostein and welcome again to Poland Daily Weather. So now let's see what will happen tomorrow in Poland. We are expecting quite a bit of showers around Rzeszów, Lublin, also in central Poland. Uh, the rest should be remaining dry. The minimum temperature will be 13 also in Rzeszów, 14 degrees in Krakow, Katowice, Wrocław. And the warmest will be the area of Bydgoszcz with 18 degrees, also 17 degrees in Warsaw, uh, Poznań and Zielona Góra. Szczecin and up in Koszalin where we will be also seeing a lot of sun. Also Olsztyn will see 17 degrees. Now let's check the forecast in Europe for tomorrow. Tomorrow in Europe a uh, very cool in Madrid 12 degrees, Celsius 16 degrees in Lisbon and both of those places will be seeing a lot of showers. 17 degrees will be seen in Vilnius, 19 in Warsaw, 18 degrees in London with sun and clouds so that's nice and warm, 14 in Dublin and 23 in Paris which will be one of the warmer places tomorrow. This is all for tonight, thank you and see you soon. The history of Krakow's Obwajanki dates back to the Middle Ages. 
The first known mention of it dates back to 1394. In the financial books of King Vladislav II Yagyewo and Queen Hedwig's court, it was noted for the Queen Pro Circulus Obvajanki I Grosh. The name Obvajanki refers to its production process and derives from Obvajic, to parboil, a distinctive technique of boiling the dough. The Latin name Circulius and Cicinellos refer in turn to the Obvajanic's round shape. Obvajanki is traditionally produced by bakers. At first, they were baked only during Lent. In the 13th century, the Baker's Guild was created in Krakow. Back then, the Obvajanki could only be made inside the city walls by specific bakers who were allowed to sell them in the bakery stalls around Sukinanitsa on the main market. The production and selling of the Obvajanki was carefully monitored by the members of the guild back then, but it's likely that from the mid-19th century, any baker could make them. Up until the 1950s, the Obvajanki were sold from linen-lined wicker baskets. So now we're waiting for the dough. Yeah, I think it should be about ready. Uh, Susa? Yeah, of course. Wow. Uh, I, I think you mix it well. Yeah, good job, Paolo. <laughs> Congratulations right. to me. Okay, so I will just take it because we don't need it anymore. Okay. So, what's the next step then? Okay, so now, every of you will got the ball of the dough, but we didn't name this ball as a ball, we name it counts. In a translation, it's like one bite of food, but uh -huh. you just need to learn it. So yeah, so you got, our, got your cans, and now just leave it on the table and All wait. Right. <laughs> so we're going to be shaping our own... Yeah. Obvajanic. Obvajanic, okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Am I allowed to just sort of freestyle with, with my shape? No, or I, is I, it quite I, I'm going to tell you everything. There's yeah. a special all way right. to do it, probably. All right, all right. Okay, so now you need to knead the dough in your hands. Right. Mm, feels good. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's the smell of the yeast. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's it's really right. strong. Mm -hmm. yeah. It reminds me of my childhood. Yeah, yeah you ate of the Janet during childhood? No, but just the, the smell of yeast. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. So this bit, what, what, what are we achieving by sort of kneading the dough? Uh, it will be easier to work with it later. Aha, uh -huh, so yeah. it's making it a bit more flexible yeah. as we go along. Mm -hmm. And what do we do once we've kneaded the dough? Okay, so I think it will be enough. Mm -hmm. So now we need to divide a dough in a half to create two small cancer. Okay, Oops. sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, and one we need to put somewhere aside, one in the middle in front of us. Because now, from this one small can, we will create sulka. Sulka is the second word that you need to learn today. So first one was cans, now it's sulka, because we don't translate it. And what is sulka? It's just the roll, but we will do it in a specific way. Because you need to roll it and move your hands from the inside part to the outside part mm. of the okay. dough. So you need to put your both hands and just start to rolling. And you need to push it to the table. Are you getting on, Paolo? <laughs> have you done anything uh, like this before? I'm not sure. No, have you? No. Well, I'm, besides I'm baking to... cake. Uh, baking a cake, okay. That's some yeah. kind of... Yeah, and your sulka is supposed to be like that long. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Mine is way short. We have to hurry up. Yeah, and if you need a help, just ask me. I will help you. Okay. okay. I might need some help, I think. Okay. Give as embarrassing decision. as it looks compared Look, to John. Look, more okay. like rolling like that. Well. Still not working quite in the same way. Right. You know, nobody said that it's easy work, you know. No, <laughs> right. It looks easier than yeah. it is. <laughs> no, and but you're here every morning doing this. Yeah. You're doing yeah. a good job, John. Thank you. Oh, thanks. All right. Oh, you're already there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and of course, uh, if you finish uh, the first one, Sulka, you need to do the second one. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed same. to be same long, so oh, okay. yeah. Same length again, Paolo, right? Okay. For me, it's like a 15 seconds so <laughs> to do it, so... <laughs> you need a help? Uh, maybe I do. <laughs> I think I'm nearly there, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and watch, you can do the second I'll one. I'll watch your technique and see what I'm maybe doing wrong here. 
thought that's what I was doing, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Watching it, I'm like, isn't that what I was doing? You know, you need to visit us again. And <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> and practice. <laughs> exactly. Right. But also you can create obwarzanki at home. Yeah? Yeah, if you are interested about it on our um, page uh, in the internet, uh -huh. you can find uh, recipes for homemade obwarzanki. Okay. It's a little bit different than this one uh, from the bakery because um, there's like six one ingredients dough. So I think I need some. <laughs> it's really hard to Are get it at home. Are you talking about a fat bit in the middle? <laughs> yeah. There, yeah. <laughs> wow. Whoops. Just yeah, it happened. It got back. more rolling, less stretching. You know. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's getting a bit carried away. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so that's oh, for thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bit of weakness down at this end. <laughs> um, uh, can you help that recover? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we seem to be getting a little bit closer <laughs> to the actual uh, final outcome of a, an old Vajanic. Okay, so much now you need to more. put your silk up, like in front of you. Right. And now take the two ends, squeeze it. I'm going to braid them. No. I mean, not break braid. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, right, right, yes. <laughs> yeah, and now we need to twist it just like a, I don't know, fake braid. So maybe we just need to do it something like that. Okay. And then we will twist our obwarzanek a little bit more to create like more um, bakery shape, I can name it. Okay. Yeah. But you need to be careful because we can untwist it. So <laughs> you need to twist it in a good way. Another. Yeah. So yeah, you need to put both hands on your obwarzanek and then just roll it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Really great. Yeah, it's enough. It will untwist a little bit, but it still will have yeah. better shape. Okay, and now we need to take the two ends of our obwarzanki yeah. and just squeeze the dough together. And you need to do it like really, really hard because obviously likes to open when we put it into the boiling mm -hmm. water. Uh -huh. And what is funny, sometimes around the city you can buy like open one of Varanki. Ah. Because it's normally happened in a bakery. Where they went wrong. Rolled by amateurs. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, just they need to do it fast sometimes, so. <laughs> I see, I see. Does, does that make it cheaper if it's opened up? Actually, no. No? No, <laughs> oh, dick. Feel a little bit cheated, wouldn't you, if yes. it was a, a sort of. It's not a one. real option. Yeah, then. exactly. Okay, so now I will give you the small sticks. One's for you. Oh, Carla. Thank you. Uh, for you. Thank you. And of course, pans. So now you need to sign your stick in here. I don't know, name, nickname, whatever you want, because later, thanks for that, we will recognize our obwarzanki. Okay. I'll just put a P on mine. Okay, so right. I'll take it. Okay, and now you need to take the stick and put it in a place where you connect the two ends of your vajanek because it will help to um, keep it together. Uh -huh. oh, totally not this direction. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a little sort of flag. No, flag. not like a flag. Oh, hey. Me too. <laughs> Okay, so they are almost ready. Okay. In a minute, I will take it to the bakery. Now you need to tell me, do you know any seeds for obwarzanek? Sesame seeds? That's yeah, what really I was great. gonna say. Sun, Five. flour? No. no, no. Sesame. What's the, um, the black, uh, the... Poppy seeds. Poppy, Poppy seeds, yeah. seeds, right, yeah. Poppy seeds, sesame seeds. <sighs> Anything else? We have a, a really uh, closer to the main in here. That you heard about it? Salt mine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we have a salt from the Vialitka. So, yeah. Ah, salt. so with only, only a salt? Yeah. Uh huh. Sugar? The next one is, no, they are always salty. The next one is cheese, and the last one is spicy one. We don't have an actually name on it. But yeah, so we have a five seeds for Obwarzanek. In our bakery, we have this free original. So, poppy seeds, sesame, and salt. Now you need to decide which one do you want, and I will be back and ask you about it. All right then. Okay. What are you going to go for, Paola? Maybe cheese? Cheesy Ovajanka. Oh. All I right. I've never tried it, so... No, I haven't had a cheesy one. I think I'm going to go for, for cheese and for sesame seeds, I think. Yeah. 
cheese, sesame seeds, and salt I'm going to go for. Can one use all of them? I mean, or is it only one? No, you things? always need to choose one. Mm. Only one? Yeah. Oh, I just got a bit carried away. Oh, my <laughs> good cheese, and I'll go for sesame seeds on mine then. Okay, so sesame? Yeah. yeah. And your? And for me, cheese. Please. No, we have oh. only poppy seeds, sesame, and salt. I told ah, you. okay. That's not what I understood. Um, so, sesame, what are you having? I'm having uh, sesame seeds. Ah, so I'll have maybe the poppy seeds. <laughs> The Ovojanic has been awarded the status of Protected Geographical Indication. In 2010, the European Commission recognized that the round and platted snack as a part of the culinary heritage of Krakow, as well as the tradition of the city. The certificate strictly determines the weight, shape, and production process of the Ovojanki, and it can only be given to the bakers from the city of Krakow or the counties of Krakow and Wieliczka. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today we are at the city of Lublin. We will meet with Mr. Martin Delbrock, a Dutchman that moved to Lublin, fell in love with the city, and now worked as a tour guide showing the world Lublin's most crown jewels. We are standing here inside the Lublin Castle Museum, and I was wondering, before it became a museum, what purpose did the castle serve? Oh, that is a very good question, because the history of this place dates back for, for ages and ages, you know, in the 1200s, you had here a castle with the keep, the keep is um, built around that time. Right. Uh, but uh, this place has not always been a museum, mm -hmm. and actually we are not standing in the castle. Right. Everybody is used to calling it a castle, yeah. uh, in Polish, the Zamek, you know, everybody, castle, yeah. it's a castle, but it isn't. We are actually standing in a prison. Uh, a or a former prison, yes. Right. Um, the castle um, became in decline during the ages. Um, the condition became poorer and poorer. Mm -hmm. Everything was literally affected. So um, the Holy Trinity Chapel was in a poor condition, mm -hmm. the, uh, the structure of the castle itself. Mm -hmm. And they actually decided to destroy the castle. It were the Russians. Right. Between 1823 and 1826, they simply knocked down the castle. They only kept uh, Don John the Keep mm -hmm. and the Holy Trinity Chapel, and the whole other structure was simply knocked down right. and integrated by purpose and prison. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, you know, we have a beautiful painting behind us. Mm -hmm. On the painting, you see uh, a view of Lublin, a panorama, and you can see the castle on it, mm -hmm. uh, and also the castle already in its current state. Right. Uh, the thing about the prison is, is that it was actually a very sad place. Of course. Because uh, it was heavily used by uh, the Nazis during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, we have here in town Majdanek, the mm -hmm. uh, Nazi concentration camp, the right. former Nazi concentration mm -hmm. camp. Um, mainly Jewish people were held there and were murdered there. And the Nazis used this place for the resistance fighters. Right. So, um, literally, people were imprisoned here. They were tortured here, um, all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. many people were killed here. It had yeah. a tremendously high killing rate. Mm -hmm. To give you a horrible example, on the last day before the liberation in '44, they shot 300 people here in the workshops at the time in the prison. Literally cold-blooded, they came mm. in with their machine guns, and the people were mown down. Mm. What I personally don't like the most about the prison is that um, it kept a prison between 44, the liberation, right. and 54. Mm -hmm. And it was in use by um, the secret communist police. Mm -hmm. And 333 people lost here their life mm -hmm. because they had anti communist views. Mm. So that makes it even more set up to me that the, the killing didn't stop. Right, right. Like the mayor. Disagreement in political ideology might end up with uh, imprisonment and death. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's, there was no freedom of speech at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then something changed. Mm -hmm. In 1954, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They wanted to celebrate uh, the 10th University of the People's Republic of Poland. Sure. Because um, they had a very good reason to pick Lublin. Mm -hmm. a significant reason, because Lublin became the capital of Poland just after the liberation. Right. So that, now we switch to something positive. Mm -hmm. We were for a short time, but <laughs> anyway, we have been twice in our history the capital of Poland, right. after the First World War mm -hmm. and after the Second one. Mm -hmm. And the peoples of, yeah, the political party, let's say it in this way, wanted mm -hmm. to celebrate um, their anniversary, so they decided to built a museum here in a right. castle, mm -hmm. but also they beautifully restored our historical center. Mm -hmm. Because we have an, um, a Renaissance center here in Lublin, mm -hmm. uh, the old town. Mm -hmm. And after the Second World War, many buildings were simply yeah, damaged by the war. Nothing was done with it. And they decided, from, okay, let's restore it. And in this way, you know, you can literally see the beauty of Lublin in the old town as it was in the past. The Lublin Castle was turned into a prison by the Russian Empire in 1831 and retained this function until 1954. In the years following the end of the Second World War, around 30,000 Polish opponents to the Soviet Union's occupation of Poland were imprisoned here at one point or another. Next up, we will talk to Mr. Dalebout about the role Lublin played in the Polish anti-communist movement. So you were just telling me that this structure served as a prison for the Russian empires, later on the Nazis, and again the, the Soviet Union. And, but I also know that Lublin has a significant place in the, the anti-communist movement, and yeah. I was wondering if you can tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, no, definitely spot on. Um, yeah a world-famous person, mm -hmm. John Paul II. He was teaching here in Lublin mm -hmm. at the Catholic University. Right. And this was literally the only university in Poland which was independent. Mm -hmm. So on, in other cities, for example, take the capital Warsaw, mm -hmm. right. if you went to university, they were teaching Marxism, mm -hmm. the doctrine of Marxism. Mm -hmm. Here, this was not the case. It was right. literally independent and I could speak freely. Mm -hmm. And of course, John Paul II had an extremely strong voice against communism mm -hmm. in, in Poland mm -hmm. and actually behind the curtain. Right. What he was doing out of the Vatican was literally broadcasting the message of hope, mm -hmm. the message of that we could get change in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. um, that was he providing. And he, was, he has been here in Lublin, mm -hmm. as for example, um, at the Arts Cathedral, a beautiful monument mm -hmm. uh, remembering his visit mm -hmm. to Lublin. And he was mentioning Lublin um, um, on multiple occasions. For example, if you go to the Arts Cathedral, we have there the painting of the crying Madonna, mm -hmm. and it is part of the Maria cult. And it was also stated by the Pope that it is part of the Maria cult. So definitely Lublin had a warm place in the heart of the Pope. Uh, we, mm -hmm. A spot for Lublin was reserved in his heart. I I do notice that there is a lot of church influence in, around Lublin and I saw a lot of churches on my way here built in the Renaissance style, not just churches but the structure in a whole and can you tell me a little bit about the influence? Yeah, it is all related to pancakes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a great fire here in uh, 1575, that was the first great fire mm -hmm. and it has, all, it has all to do with Jadwiga. Okay. Jadwiga was um, a simple lady living here in town mm -hmm. and she was greedy. And Jadwiga decided that uh, during a trade fair that she wanted to sell off pancakes. Mm -hmm. And in her humble opinion, she had the best recipe in town. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, mix that with the greediness of her, she started to bake um, piles of pancakes. Mm -hmm. The more the better. Right. And she couldn't stop. So during the night, she kept on frying pancakes. Mm -hmm. And Fatih Kay kicked in, of course. Mm -hmm. She fell to sleep in the fire. Her fire, where she was baking on, sprung out of control mm -hmm. and literally whole Lublin burned down. Mm -hmm. So the beautiful buildings you see here in town, like the Kroska Gate, um, the Dominican Monastery, the buildings on the market on the Rynik, mm -hmm. they were all touched by that fire. Literally no building was untouched. Mm -hmm. And this was actually a blessing for Lublin. So actually we need to erect a monument for Jadwiga mm -hmm. <laughs> because as a phoenix, mm -hmm. Lublin arised out of its ashes mm -hmm. and it was re rebuilt in this beautiful Renaissance style. And then a quirky thing, mm -hmm. if you dig into the archives and you sure. want to figure out, you know, from who was now that architect and who was building this, mm -hmm. maybe a bit boring, but some people love to do it, mm -hmm. you will come across many Italian names. 
Italian that, names. Yeah, Italian names, because the main architects were Italians. Mm -hmm. And that is so cool, you know. Nowadays, Polish people go often abroad to work, but at that time we were so rich that mm -hmm. people from abroad came to Poland to work. Ah. And they sticked in Lublin and they sticked in Poland. Mm -hmm. They really loved the, uh, the Polish ladies. Mm -hmm. They married, mm -hmm. and this is why we have so many Italian architects and Italian names right. in Lublin. As we can see, Lublin is one of the oldest cities filled with historical monuments, but the beating heart of the city, the Lublin Castle, is right behind me. The castle was a prison for over a century when Poland was under occupation, but today it serves a positive purpose of being the city's main museum. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. Well, I'm just catching my breath because I walked a very long way. And not only me, the crew did as well, and they're carrying cameras, so I shouldn't complain. Let me revivify myself. It wasn't that bad, but it is a long way. If you look just from the castle, and then you see the town beyond, that's how far up, the point is, that's how far up the castle, the castle keep is. And uh, in medieval times, nothing was more important. This was the, the last refuge uh, and also the first thing built. So the first thing built and the last refuge in case of attack. With walls, uh, what, four meters thick, I think I was reading, made of limestone. But let's see what it says here. This uh, barrel-shaped building made of stone, one of the oldest stone strongholds in the whole of the country, which means also in Central Europe, because Poland is a thousand years old. Um, it's 13th century fortifications, it was initially surrounded by uh, fortifications made of wood, probably palisades type things. Uh, and of course, this is long gone. It's not going to last very long. Uh, we have also presumed the castle was first erected after 1286 and founded uh, by, uh, well, we know who, uh, by Kazimierz's father, Kazimierz Wielki, Kazimierz the Great, his father. Some of the features indicate fort fortification was probably built at the end of the 13th century. Okay, it was erected using local stone, as I said, limestone. Here it's confirmed. Four meters thick in, in the lower part. It's as high as, as 20, that's higher than 20 meters though. And uh, I mean, if you look at that, just have a look at that. It's, it's, that's, that's higher than 20 meters, it's gotta be. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing, I'm not great on meters. The door is located at six meters level, it says, but it looks higher to me as well. Again, I'm probably not good at meters and uh, operating better in feet. The tower of the castle uh, were some of the leading, uh, this tower of the castle was some of the leading fortifications in this part of Małopolska, that's lesser Poland, greater Poland being the part which is uh, around, uh, centered around uh, Poznan and uh, the beginning of Poland. A lot of people think that, 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 that Poznan, for example, uh, is German by right, but actually it's where Poland began. Uh, a surprising fact needs to be said. It would be appropriate to categorize, uh, sorry, uh, the tower can be associated with areas of Upper Hungary and present-day Slovakia. That would be present-day Slovakia, yeah. Um, it was functioning as a customs collection point. Now I want, to, I want you to see this, come with me, because this is really neat. This is amazing because I reckon I reckon that this place was not just a, uh, a fortification or a collection point for customs. Imagine having to come all the way up this hill uh, to pay your duty. Made you think twice, I guess. But uh, especially, 
Talk about the burden of taxation, right? The heavy burden of taxation. Walking up here with your coins. Look at how far in the distance we can see. I mean, this is kilometers and kilometers down the river, uh, this particular direction. Um, this direction less far, even, even at this time of year where the, the leaves are yet to come out. Not so far this time of year. But brilliantly towards Krakow, which was, of course, the heart of the, of the country uh, at this uh, time when this was built and where Kazimierz himself was located. So, hey, what if you put a light? If you put a light up there at the very top of that, wouldn't you be able to see it coming up the river? Wouldn't you know how far you had to go? And couldn't that be helpful, especially uh, if you were under attack or uh, you had to make a deadline with a load of grain? Because, hey, even then they had deadlines. So. Look at this commanding view. Once again, it's awe-inspiring. And think about what it took to get this, this limestone structure built. It's amazing. I love castles and uh, nothing, <laughs> I get most of my friends enjoy this sort of thing too. Nothing better than a medieval castle. Uh, it's the real stuff. Okay, Poland Daily Travel. We're gonna go take a look uh, from the top. Stay with us. <laughs> And so now we climb the tower just as they would have in medieval times. The watchman would have kept an eagle eye out for traffic on the river and for any wayward invaders. Let's take a look at the impressive view over the river valley. It's only about 150 steps, no problem. Whoa, you gotta be careful coming up. Very narrow stairs. I should be a lot more out of breath than I am, and I was out of breath, but the, the uh, pleasures of filmmaking, the artifice of filmmaking, I did stop before I came that final, that final section, because it's, it's a pretty long walk. Let, let's start and look where we're looking. Okay, right here, we're looking towards uh, Janowicz, which is a, that Renaissance castle, uh, which is down there on the, uh, other bank, just where the river is bending. Um, then we see below us the uh, various, the castle, and then the various uh, buildings that make up the uh, center of the village. Okay, so that's what's going in this direction, which is uh, south. So let's move around here and see what else we got. Oh, right. Yes, they were communicating using flags like these, right? So you would take this flag and you would show this flag. Um, they were establishing signs, right? It says right here. So you can send a message. Uh, two flags means, like this means come up. So if you have two flags like this, it means you can come up. Um, don't come up is like this. If the flags are like this, it means look out, we are under siege. So before, as I said, you're, you're signaling way down the river, you're under siege. So that means you're under attack, right? And if you put both flags end to end like this, um, well, it's supposed to fly like that. But at any rate, if you have both flags like this together, it means I give up. But we don't give up because we're still continuing. We've just begun. We're not giving up. We're not surrendering. And I'm saying, come up, come up. The view is good up here. Yes, people are looking down there. They heard me shouting. And uh, they're running fast the other way because they've already been here. Um, another, just a view over the delta here. Um, with the sandbars and a village of Voizhen. Voizhen, I think, I hope I said that correctly. Let's move on. And I think we're gonna get a view of the town of Puavi. When you come from Warsaw, you're coming south along the Viswa, as you saw from, if you saw a previous episode, when we were, we stopped and did an episode out by the river, uh, the beautiful river. We came through this town, this is Puavi. 
and uh, the uh, the main towns in this area would be uh, Puavi and and Lublin. Uh, Puavi, I, I I forget how many people live there. Maybe forty, fifty thousand. Lublin considerably bigger, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty even. Uh, the biggest. Uh, Lublin is the biggest city of this area. Lublin somewhere over there, I think, or maybe over there. Yeah. Um, okay, that's about it. Puavi uh, is is out there. That's where the palace, the Czartoryski Palace, one of the great palaces of the country, is. Um, we will go there. We will go there if they will give us permission to film. But we haven't asked in advance. You need to do that. Okay. So that's that's the castle keep. Um, we've learned uh, about why this is here and the importance of medieval uh, medieval fortresses and location and the guy who is most important in our story today is Kazimir Shvelki, Kazimir the Great uh, who not only built this but a series of castles across Poland and they call him great because he built this nation the foundation uh, of the Polish nation in the Middle Ages very exciting stuff leading up uh, into uh, through the Renaissance. Okay, time to go. Have another look at this view. Just have another look at this view. Come on, come on. And in, in the coming summer haze, you see? Seasons changing. Beautiful day, beautiful day.